Welcome to the second video in our series looking at focused echocardiography in the sick adult. This video is complementary to the second day of our course which we ran at St George's Hospital in London. If you are a novice I would recommend looking at the first video in the series which are the basic views taught on focused intensive care echo courses. And finally once again thank you to Heartworks for letting us use their software to produce this video. So, the first window you're trying to achieve is the parasternal window, and you're trying to get a long axis view of the heart as shown. To get this view, you have to align the pointer towards the patient's right shoulder, and may be found between any rib space, especially if your patient is not in the ideal position. Optimize the image by reducing the depth so that the structures of interest take up the whole image. Let's recap the anatomy. Here is the right ventricle, the left ventricle, and you can see the anterior septal walls and the inferior lateral walls, the aortic valve, and you can see two out of the three cusps, the mitral valve, and the subvalvular apparatus, the left atrium, and the aortic root. For each of these structures, look closely to see if you can see any anatomical abnormalities. Try and get the left ventricular walls as perpendicular to the ultrasound beam as possible, and you may do this by rocking the probe, left or right as shown. Now to do your first measurements, you're going to pause the heart at the end of diastole, when the left ventricle is at its fullest. The mitral valve is just about to close, and you can also time this with the ECG, where the QRS complex is just occurring. Once you have chosen the right time frame, you're going to measure the thickness of the interventricular septum, the width of the cavity in diastole, and then the thickness of the inferior lateral wall. Now this is done with the line passing through the tips of the mitral valve, leaflets. Next, forward the image to the end of systole, where the left ventricle cavity is at its smallest. Now, measure the diameter of the cavity again at the same level as you did before. The difference between the diastolic diameter and the systolic diameter divided by the diastolic diameter gives you a measurement called fractional shortening which gives you an idea of the ejection fraction of the heart. This helpful summary of the different measurements of the left ventricle is produced by the British Society of Echocardiography, the BSC, and is freely available on their website. The last two-dimensional measurement you're going to make in this view is that of the LVOT, the left ventricular outflow tract. The timing is in mid-systole, when the majority of the ejected blood is flowing through this tube, Try and measure the diameter around 5 to 10 millimeters away from the insertion of the aortic valve. You will use this value later on to calculate cardiac output. Best practice is to try and get three measurements to ensure that your initial measurement is correct. Moving on to M mode now. With the heart as perpendicular to the ultrasound beam as possible, put the M mode beam through the tips of the mitral valve leaflets and watch that line of sight during the cardiac cycle. You can make similar measurements and calculate fractional shortening from this view as well, but it is no longer recommended due to the difficulty of getting a perpendicular heart. Next, move the M mode through the anterior mitral valve leaflet so you can see how it moves throughout the cardiac cycle towards the septal wall. This is another measurement of left ventricular contractility and how mobile the mitral valve leaflet is. The next imaging modality we're going to use is colour flow mode, often CFM on your machine. Put the box in the left ventricular outflow tract with some extension into the aortic root to look through the flow through the LVOT and the aortic valve. In particular, you're looking for high velocity flow and for regurgitant flow. Then move the box 
to the mitral valve, with the box extending into the left atrium. Here also you are looking for mitral regurgitation, reverse flow into the left atrium. By tilting the probe inferiorly, you now achieve the right ventricular inflow view, as shown. This allows you to visualize the right atrium, the tricuspid valve and the right ventricle. The tricuspid valve is highlighted in red. Again, spend some time looking for any obvious anatomical abnormalities in 2D mode. Next, put a color flow mapping box into the right atrium as shown. And here you're looking for evidence of tricuspid regurgitation, which will manifest as blue flow, i.e. away from the probe into the right atrium. If you see any, you should put a continuous wave Doppler probe through the jet to try and get a signal from it. The peak velocity of any regurgitant flow through the tricuspid valve may be used to work out the peak systolic pulmonary artery pressures. If present, you will see flow below the baseline as highlighted here. Next, by tilting the probe anteriorly, you get to see the right ventricular outflow tract and the pulmonary valve which is highlighted here. The same routine applies. Color flow box over the pulmonary valve to see if there is any regurgitation. Measure inflow through the pulmonary valve using pulse wave Doppler, and then look for regurgitation using continuous wave Doppler. And if present, this will be above the baseline as it will be regurgitant flow through the valve towards the probe, as highlighted here. Take a moment to review what we have discussed so far. Feel free to pause this slide and take it in in your own time. Next, we are going to use the same window, the parasternal window, but now we're going to look at the heart in its short axis, called the parasternal short axis view. It is useful to start at the mid papillary level, just as Feist teaches you, because by optimizing this view and getting both papillary muscles in view, it ensures that your alignment with the short axis of the heart is correct. Let's recap the anatomy. The right ventricle is highlighted, which wraps around the left ventricle, and there, as discussed, are the papillary muscles, identifying this as the mid papillary level. By tilting the probe, you get to see the apex of the heart and note that the papillary muscles are no longer present. You're now looking at the base of the heart. Note that you see the mitral valve there in short axis, which looks like a fish mouth throughout the cardiac cycle. It is important when looking for regional wall abnormalities to spend some time looking at each segment of the left ventricle at each of these three different levels. By doing that, you can create a bullseye, as shown here, to accurately identify any regional wall abnormalities and map them for future reference. As you can see, the base of the heart, where you see the mitral valve, can be split into six. The mid papillary level can be split into six and the apex is split into four. The names of these segments are shown in this diagram here. By further tilting the probe anteriorly, you get to look at the great vessel view of the heart. With the aortic valve in the middle, as highlighted, the right ventricle anterior to this, the right atrium, which is highlighted, and the left atrium, highlighted there. Again, spend some time looking for any obvious anatomical abnormalities with the valves or the chambers. By optimizing the image, you can make some 2D measurements of the right ventricle. Again, pausing the heart at the end of diastole, you can measure the diameter of the right ventricle at a 12 o'clock position from the aortic valve as shown. You can also measure the diameter of the right ventricular outflow tract. The same sequence applies. Color flow mapping can be put over the pulmonary valve to again look for pulmonary regurgitation, over the aortic valve to look for aortic regurgitation, and over the tricuspid valve to again look for tricuspid regurgitation.
If you see regurgitation with colour flow, you can try and capture it and quantify it with continuous wave Doppler. You can also measure the inflow through the pulmonary valve here if you want to. Moving back down to the mid papillary level, you can make a quantitative measurement of ejection fraction. By pausing the heart in end diastole, you can trace the internal diameter of the heart at this level. Make sure you exclude the papillary muscles as shown here. Repeat this for when the cavity is at its smallest, at the end of systole. The difference between the two areas, divided by the end diastolic area, gives you an estimation of ejection fraction. Spend a moment recapping what we have done with the parasternal short axis views. Pause this slide and take it in your own time. We are now changing our window from parasternal window to an apical window and we are first trying to achieve an apical four chamber view. Let's recap the anatomy. The right ventricle is highlighted there. The left ventricle is there. The mitral valve the tricuspid valve, the left atrium and the right atrium can all be seen in this view and try and ensure that both mitral and tricuspid valves are seen so you can accurately compare the sizes of the right and left ventricles. Now pause the heart at the end of diastole. Measure the right ventricle at its base as shown here and also the left ventricle at its base as this allows you to compare the sizes of the left ventricle against the right ventricle. If the right ventricle is as big as the left ventricle, that is moderately dilated. If the right ventricle is bigger than the left ventricle, it is massively dilated. Measure the right ventricle at its midpoint and also its length. And there are normal values for each of these levels. Next, we are going to measure the size of the atria. The first method is a simple 2D measurement and this is the technique that's best used. Make sure that your measurement is done at the end of systole, that's when the atria are at its fullest, just before atrial contraction. And you can measure the area of both atria if you want to be even more accurate. Again. There are norms for all of these values. Once you have made an assessment of the size of these cavities, you're now going to try and make an assessment of the function. Focus in on the tricuspid valve annulus, as shown here. This moves towards the right ventricular apex during systole and by measuring its excursion gives you a surrogate of right ventricular systolic function. This is called TAPSI which stands for tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. You measure this using M mode as shown here and identify the structure which is moving towards the apex once paused. The normal value should be greater than 16 millimeters. And this represents longitudinal function of the right ventricle, the most important way the right ventricle contracts. You can do the same with the mitral valve annulus, but the left ventricle doesn't contract longitudinally as much as the right. The left ventricle ejection fraction depends much more on its radial function. However, a decrease in its longitudinal contractility is seen and is an early sign in ischemic heart disease. You can measure the annular plane movement at either side of the mitral valve, but just note that the values of normal differ at each point. Next in the sequence is color flow imaging. And again, we put the box in the right atrium to look for tricuspid regurgitation. 
and then in the left atrium to look for mitral regurgitation. Next, let's look at the mitral valve. First, using pulsed wave Doppler, let's look at flow through the mitral valve or left ventricular inflow. The normal waveform looks a little bit like this with two peaks, the first and biggest in health representing passive left ventricular filling and the second representing filling due to atrial contraction which, as I said, normally represents between 10 and 30 percent of the total filling. You can measure this objectively by measuring the peak of both waves labelled E for the passive filling and A for the active filling and also the gradient of deceleration of the E wave and we'll talk about these things later. Next, switch to continuous wave Doppler, which is useful to quantify any regurgitation or, if you suspect mitral stenosis, to look for the peak velocities as well. It is optional to look at pulmonary vein flow. Placing the pulsed wave Doppler curve in the pulmonary vein as shown allows you to measure the flow into the left atrium. If there is very high left atrial pressures, you may get flow reversal, which can be seen quite nicely using this method. Finally, if you do see any tricuspid regurgitation on colour flow imaging, then make sure you try and quantify it with continuous wave Doppler. Take a moment to recap what we've talked about so far in the apical four-chamber view. Now, by tilting the probe more anteriorly, you bring in the left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve, as shown here. Just be aware that the aortic valve can look more calcified than it actually is in this orientation. But after a 2D inspection, put color flow into the LVOT to look for nice laminar flow through the LVOT and also for regurgitant flow during diastole. Next, we're going to look through the flow through the LVOT using pulse wave Doppler. By placing your sample volume in the LVOT between 5 and 10 millimeters away from the insertion of the aortic valve, this allows you to measure flow at the same level that you measured the diameter. In the, the waveform you produce should be, as shown, a clear envelope which is hollow in the middle. And this identifies you at being at the correct place. Beware, don't sample too close to the aortic valve as flow accelerates as it gets closer to the valve and you're going to overestimate your flow through the LVOT and therefore overestimate cardiac output. By integrating the curve that you get from this measurement, as shown, this gives you what's called a stroke distance or velocity time integral. It represents how much blood has moved within one cardiac cycle. By multiplying this value, which is a distance, by the area of your LVOT, which you can calculate from the diameter that you measured previously, and then multiplying that value by the heart rate, you get an idea of what cardiac output is. Finally, measure the velocities through the LVOT and the aortic valve using continuous wave Doppler. If there is high flow, the continuous wave Doppler will be able to quantify this best. And if there is aortic stenosis, this will give you an idea of the severity of it by calculating the peak and mean gradients. Now, rotate your probe round 90 degrees. This will give you an apical two-chamber view. And here you see the anterior wall, and the inferior wall. This is helpful when looking for regional wall abnormalities. By rotating the probe another 30 degrees or so, you bring in the left ventricular outflow tract, and this is the so-called three-chamber view. Here you can see the aortic valve, the anterior septal wall, and the inferior lateral wall of the left ventricle.
And putting this information together with the apical 2 chamber and the apical 4 chamber, and also the information you've gathered from your short axis view of the left ventricle, you can start to really put together a detailed map of any regional wall abnormalities. If you struggled to get good images of the left ventricular outflow tract and aortic valve in the apical 5 chamber, you may have better luck here. Have a look with the colour flow imaging to see if there's any aortic regurgitation or flow acceleration, and you also may be able to use pulse wave Doppler and continuous wave Doppler here as well. Our final window is the subcostal window, and here we are first trying to achieve a four-chamber view of the heart. Let's recap the anatomy. First you have the right ventricle, which lies just on top of the liver, the left ventricle, the right atrium, and the left atrium. Now beware, people often get the left ventricular outflow tract in this view as well, but by optimizing the image you get to see the atrial septum. You can also pause the image here and measure the thickness of the right ventricular wall. By rotating the probe around 90 degrees you can actually achieve short axis views of the heart in a similar manner as you did with the parasternal window. By rotating the probe further so the marker is now towards the head, you get the IVC which enters the right atrium. And this view is useful for looking at how the IVC diameter changes throughout the respiratory cycle. An IVC of less than one centimeter which collapses is highly suggestive of a state that would respond to fluids. And a distended IVC of greater than two centimeters with no respiratory variation is suggestive of a state that wouldn't respond to fluid. You can use M mode to look at the change of the IVC diameter throughout the cardiac cycle and throughout the respiratory cycle. By using this information in conjunction with the right atrial size, you can make an estimate of what right atrial pressure is. Useful if there is no central line. Finally, don't forget to look at both lung bases, and in particular, you're looking for effusions, diaphragmatic movement, and you can even see lung consolidation in this view as well. And that's your scan finished. Make sure you clean your patient, you clean your machine, you store your images according to your local policy, and you write a report. For further information on what's considered normal, please go to the British Society of Echocardiography website and download this very, very useful handbook. And the following slides represent a summary of what we have discussed in this video.